message is brought to you by Ven Moody and the Worship Center Christian Church, where we are committed to honoring God, unifying communities, and building people. We hope you enjoy this message, and thank you for supporting our ministry. We are in a uh, an exciting uh, series of teaching called Hero, and as we get into week three or part three of this series, I want to ask you to join me in Mark chapter five, Mark chapter five, beginning at verse 21, and I want to spend some time walking through uh, this passage. Um, it's a long passage, and so we want to kind of divide it up and uh, walk through it together this morning, but in Mark chapter five, beginning at verse 21... It says this, it says, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he pleaded earnestly. Some translations say he begged him. He pleaded earnestly. He begged him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus uh, went with him and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And there was a woman there, notice this, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. As we study this passage and as we hear from the Lord in this teaching series called Hero, I, I want to walk through this passage and invite you to look at this with me with this thought in mind. Two sides of the same coin. Two sides of the same coin. Now, I, I pray one of the things that we've been talking about in this series is the Desire by God cards. And uh, I just found out that we are completely out of these cards and we've ordered more and they'll be here on next Sunday. And, and I pray that you've been able to, to get these cards and to hand these out. A part of what uh, I hear the Lord really saying for our church is to really be uh, in offensive mode as it relates to sharing our faith and inviting people uh, to meet Jesus through our ministry. In fact, on August 12th, uh, the back of the card has some information about, you know, uh, meeting us at the worship center on August 12th because we're going to uh, be giving away something very special. It's going to be the largest giveaway we've ever done in our church history. And we love to give stuff away to just model the generosity of Jesus Christ. Um, and so I hope that um, even though we're out this Sunday that you've uh, picked up some of these and have been handing them out. Uh, because I know that what God is asking us to do in this season is really, really important as a family of faith. And I think that we're going to look back on this and understand that in an even greater way why God was asking us to do this. And while I know that this is uh, what God has asked for us, and while so many of you uh, have grabbed cars and have been handing them out, so much so that we're literally out of cars, I believe, at all of our campuses, I'm also aware that this notion of handing out a card or just inviting people to church or sharing just an amazing testimony about some of the things that God has done in your life, I, I, I'm aware that this may be foreign to, to many of us. And part of the reason that this is foreign to many of us is because often our main concern, our, our main priority are our own needs not necessarily the needs of other people. And while I understand that, I want you to know that God, I think, is focusing us here because one of the things that God is trying to share with us and show us is that there is a connection between our needs and the needs of other people. There, there is a, a connection. They are interwoven together. There's a connection between getting uh, our needs met but then also helping to meet the needs of other people. 
In essence, there are two sides of the same coin. This is, in fact, part of the reason why everything that happens in these verses that we've looked at and we'll be looking at in Mark chapter 5, it all revolves around a lake. The incidences with Jesus having these encounters happens around a lake. And, and particularly, this lake had two shores. And as a matter of fact, anytime something has a left, we know that it has a right. Anytime something has a top, we know that there's a bottom. Anything, anytime there's something that has one side, we also know that you can count on it having another side. If there's an up, we know that there's what? A down. If there's an outside, then we know then that there's also a... So when you get to verse 21 and it says, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side of the lake. The Word of God is giving us insight into two sides of the same coin. This is why this passage revolves around not just one person in need, but two people. There is, there is a dying girl, but then there's also a sick woman. Two sides of the same coin. Jesus crossed over, over to the other side of the lake. And let's deal with that for a second because that's important. You can't run past that too quickly because often in Scripture, in the Word of God, water and, and, and bodies of water, lakes and streams and rivers and oceans are symbolic of the tides of our lives. And the point here that God is making is that you cannot just look at your life in a one-dimensional kind of way. You've got to look at both sides of your life. In essence, you cannot just just look at the side that is most important to you now. You cannot just look at the side that you care about now. You cannot just focus only on your needs. You've got to look at both sides, your needs and the needs of others. Because whether you know it or not, the truth is we, we are all connected. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, we, we are all connected regardless of your degree, your pedigree, regardless of where you've grown up or what your current occupation is. The truth is we are all connected. The storms I've gone through, you're going to go through. The storms that you have learned from are the same storms that I'm going to have to learn from. I, I am where you're going or you are where I am headed because we are all connected. Are you following me? When you look at me, you ought to see yourself. When I look at you, I ought to see things in you that represent me because we are connected. It's two sides of the same coin. And so in verse 21, when it says that Jesus went to the other side of the lake, notice what else happens. It says that there's a large crowd that then gathers around him. And in that crowd, there's a synagogue ruler, a man by the name of Jairus. He comes to Jesus. Now, as a synagogue ruler, this is important because it means that he's the one that ran the services in the synagogue. He was the one who led. Being a synagogue ruler meant that he had status and uh, position and prestige and power and authority. Yet with all of that, he comes to Jesus, falls at Jesus' feet and begs him, pleads with him to come back to his house and to heal his daughter. Now, it's really easy to understand a father's love for their children. Now, that's really easy. Parents understand the love they have uh, for, for their children. I love my children in an indescribable way and would do anything for them. And all parents understand that. And so it's really easy to understand this father coming to Jesus on behalf of his dying daughter. But I want you to understand that the Word of God is showing us something that's so much bigger and much deeper than this natural relationship between a father and his daughter. Symbolically and spiritually, the Word of God is showing us a hero. The Word of God is showing us a hero because in Jairus coming to Jesus on behalf of his daughter, listen to me, it's a spiritual picture of someone who cares about the next generation. It's a spiritual picture of somebody who cares about the people coming behind him. In other words, what God is showing us in this passage is so much bigger than just a father caring for his daughter. God is literally showing us somebody who cares about more than just their own needs. They are caring about the needs of others. Jairus has position. Jairus has uh, prestige. Jairus has status. But in the face of 
of his daughter dying, he understands that, that none of that is sufficient to speak to this situation. He, he understands that money and fame and status and station in life is not sufficient to save his dying daughter, to save the next generation. He understands that the most substantial, the most significant, the most important thing that he can do is to get her to Jesus or get Jesus to her. So he falls at the feet of Jesus and begs him, come to my house, lay your hand on my dying daughter, touch the next generation, because if you touch them, they will be saved. And, and I love it in verse 24. Hope you didn't close your Bible. It says literally that Jesus went with him. This is the heart of our Savior, that, that immediately... Jesus went with him. And as Jesus, the Bible says, began to go with Jairus, there's this large crowd that is following him and they're pressing around him. That, that phrase, they're pressing around him, means literally people are pressing each other and pushing each other and shoving because they're all trying to get to Jesus because they want to touch him. They want to get close to him to get their own needs met. So look at this. Jesus is trying to get to this dying girl. He's trying to get to the next generation. He's trying to meet their needs. But he is inundated with other people trying to get to him because they want their needs met. You just missed it. He's trying to get to Jairus' house to meet the needs of somebody else. But he's inundated. He's pushed and pressed because he's surrounded by people that their main focus is to get their needs met. The crowd around him is only concerned about getting their needs met and they are completely oblivious to the fact that, that Jesus is trying to meet the needs of others. Oh, you missed it. it. It's real easy to become so preoccupied with our own needs, our own drama, our own issues, our own hang-ups to the point that we uh, sometimes will ignore the needs of others, the needs of the next generation, those folk that are coming behind us. Often, often, often our only concern is what we need, what we want, what we got to have. To the degree that if we're not careful, we will turn a blind eye to what others need, to, to what others have to have. As a matter of fact, let me ask you this question. When was the last time you had a burden to pray and a burden to fast and seek the face of God? Watch this. Not for your stuff. But for the needs of others. What, what about those folk who are on the highway to hell because they don't know Jesus? What, 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 about, what about the people who are drowning in despair? What, what about the individuals who are in over their head in hopelessness? It, it's, it's so easy to, to trample on, on their needs and on their issues in our press for promotion and breakthrough. And God, I want a bigger house. Or God, I, I want this and I, and I want that. What, what about others' needs? But this is why in verse 25, things abruptly shifts. Uh, there, there's a shifting in the text, and, and it says automatically, uh, instantly, there's a woman who appears. And she's been bleeding for 12 years. Now, now look at this. We start off with a dying girl. But then immediately, the story shifts. And we go from a dying girl to a sick woman who's been bleeding internally for 12 years. Two sides of the same coin. You, you, you missed it. We start off with the dying girl, but then the text shifts. And we're introduced to this sick woman, this woman who's got this issue of hemorrhaging and bleeding uh, for 12 years. Two sides of the same coin. And what's the significance? What is God saying here? He's saying to us, pay attention to this, because whenever there is a dying girl that has been forgotten about, it will result in a sick woman. Yeah, I, I think y'all missed it. Let me say it this way. Whenever the next generation, whenever those coming behind us have been forgotten, it will result in the older generation being sick. Two, two sides of the same coin. Please understand that the dying girl and the sick woman are connected. The woman had been bleeding. She'd been sick, subject to, to this internal hemorrhage for guess how long? 12 years. 
The dying girl is how old? At the end of this story, it tells us she's 12 years old. The, 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 the other gospels uh, tell you up front, this woman's 12. So watch this. The older woman has been sick as long as this dying girl has been living. Two, two sides of the same coin. What, what is God saying to us? He's saying to us that we are connected. I know you got your needs. I know you got your prayer list as we are even preparing to move into our next season of 21 days of prayer and all of that and fasting. I, I know that many of you right now have even started preparing. This is what I'm going to be praying for. And this is the kind of fast that I'm going to do. But, but I want you to understand that God is saying, hold on, hold on a second before you jump right into what you need, because you must understand that there is a connection, a connection between your needs being met and you helping to meet the needs of other people. Because as long as there is a dying girl, a next generation that has been forgotten about, there will be a result of a sick older woman. The older generation will suffer because the younger generation has been forgotten about. The present generation will suffer because they've forgotten about the folk that are coming behind them. Teach pastor, I'm doing it. See, part of the reason that, that we're dealing with the issues that we're dealing with right now in our country and in our community, part of the reason why this generation is sick and we are bleeding and we are dealing with the same issues over and over and over again is because we have become so preoccupied with our own stuff to the point that we are ignoring the needs of the next generation that is dying. I'm teaching better than your responder. So, so the first thing that this is going to involve and we're going to do this right is patience. Yeah. Because now Jairus has to wait. J Jairus has got to wait while Jesus deals with the needs of somebody else. Ah, Jairus is on the side waiting. While Jesus is talking to this woman and dealing with her. Have you ever been in a hurry? And when you're in a hurry, it feels like everybody else around you is going extra slow. Maybe this has never happened to you, but, but, but there are occasions when I leave the house a, a little bit later than I should or I get held up in a meeting and I'm trying to get to my next meeting and you hop in the car and, and you're doing your best to get there and it feels like everybody, everybody in front of you is driving extra slow. Sometimes it can feel like that with God, too. And some of you, 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 you are right there. You're wondering, God, why is it taking you so long? But you must understand that there is purpose in the interruption and even in the delay. Well, okay, I, I want you to see it. I, I want you to see it. J Jairus is sweating bullets, looking at his watch like, C -c come on, come on, come on, come on. Because he's wondering, can we get back to my house in time to save my dying daughter? And now Jesus has stopped. To deal with this woman and in the eyes of Jairus this is a profound waste of time because Jairus is only concerned about his needs the only thing that I need Jesus right now right up in here is that you wrap this up because my daughter is dying but wait a minute there's purpose in the delay and in the interruption what do you mean because what Jairus doesn't understand is that this woman who he sees as a delay, this woman that he sees as a profound waste of time, this woman actually holds the key to his breakthrough. Ah, oh, it's so easy, y'all. To feel like the needs of other people are not important. It's so easy to feel like the needs of other people are a distraction, are a waste of time. And I know that that's uh, what some of you are wrestling with. I don't know why Pastor Van is trying to get us to reach out to other people. Some of you are like, this car doesn't make uh, a change. It's not going to make a big deal. Some of you think that even handing out this little Desire by God card is, is a waste of time. That is no big deal. Nothing's going to change dramatically. But I want you to understand that, that even in the small smallest of things when you understand that God can do something in others that will impact you you understand that sometimes other people hold the key to your breakthrough oh this is so good sometimes this is the case other people hold the key to your breakthrough what, what are you talking about pastor well let's come back to this woman for a second verse 26 says that she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and it spent all she had and instead of getting better she got worse she, she had suffered the bible says under the care of, of many doctors we we have suffered 
under, under many, ma- many doctors. So, so many people think that they have the prescription for our lives. And, you know, Dr. Phil this, Judge Judy this, you know, Facebook that. So Snapchat this, you know, they tell us how to live and how to dress and how to think and, and even how we ought to uh, feel about things or what we ought to care about. And so, so many people are quick to try to prescribe stuff to you, you know, seven ways to date and 15 ways to stay married and 25 ways to be happy. But the problem is everything that they are prescribing does not work. Families are still falling apart. Half of all marriages still end in divorce. Depression and discouragement is still on the rise. We have suffered at the hands of too many so-called doctors. We, we've suffered at the hands of politicians. We've suffered at the hands of economists. We've suffered at the hands of inadequate health care and failed educational philosophies. We have suffered at the hands of people that have a crab mentality that live to pull you down instead of propping you up because they haven't dealt with their own insecurities and small-mindedness. Teach Pastor Van. We, we have suffered at the hands of many doctors, so-called doctors, and we've suffered to the degree that we have failed to uh, achieve God's very best for our lives. The Bible says this woman spent all she had, and instead of getting better, she only grew worse. Doesn't it feel like that? Doesn't it feel like our, our cities are worse? Our communities are worse? Feels like our marriages are worse? Feel, feels like our families are worse? worse our lifestyles are are getting worse and instead of getting better it really feels like we've just grown worse but but here's the good news but when she heard about Jesus yeah I'm so glad that God doesn't leave us there when it just feels like things are getting worse instead of getting better The, the word of God says but when she heard about Jesus everything began to change now I don't know exactly what she heard the Bible doesn't give us those details I don't know maybe she heard that he's a way maker and a miracle worker and a prom- I don't know what she heard maybe she heard that he's Jehovah Jireh our provider that he is Jehovah sick canoe that he is that he is Jehovah I, I don't know what she heard maybe maybe she heard that that when you were down to your last that he's a that he, he knows how to step in and take the little bit and make it and make it last I don't know maybe she heard that that when you don't know where the next meal is coming from he specializes in taking a boy's lunch and turning it into something that'll feed 5,000 I don't know maybe she heard that when you are depressed that he'll give you peace and he'll give you a peace that that the world didn't give and the world can't take away maybe maybe she heard a number of things I don't know what she heard but what I do know is that when she heard about Jesus everything in her life turned around now here's the question How did she hear? Romans 10 gives us a clue. Verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one that they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anybody preach unless they be sent? Uh, the, the answer, watch this, is Jesus. The, the answer for the community, the answer for the depression, the answer for the family falling apart, the answer for the wayward child is, is Jesus. But hold on. Before folk can call on him, they got to believe. And before they can believe, they got to hear. Before they can hear, you got to preach. Before you can preach, you got to be sent. Oh, I wish I'd get some help up in here. What is God saying? He's saying Jesus is the answer. But you got to get out there and preach the gospel. What, what, what is the gospel? I know a man that, that, that turned my life around. And I just want to give you this card because if you come and join us, you may have a chance to meet him too. I know you're thinking, but I can't, I can't preach like you. I can't preach like Pastor Quentin or Pastor Aaron. I can't, I, can't, I can't preach like them. You don't have to preach like us. The greatest preach you have is, let me tell you what he's done for me. The, great, the greatest preach you will ever have is, I don't know how to pretty it up and give you a good sermon, but I can tell you that I met him and my life is better because he came into my life. I can tell you my marriage is better because we started doing it his way. I love it. It says, watch this. She heard. She came. 
and she touched. You missed it. Yeah, okay. Where, where are the folk that get this? She, she heard. Yeah. Somebody was talking about Jesus. She heard. She said, so let me, let me come up in here. On, let, me, let, me, let me come up in here. She came, and then when she came, she touched him. Y'all still ain't with me. Come on over here. She, she heard. What, what is this you say? She came. Let me see it for myself. When she got in the atmosphere, she reached out and touched him. That's all we're trying to get people to do. We want them to hear so they'll come so they can touch. Oh, that's why worship is so transformative. Because when we worship, we create the atmosphere for somebody to reach out and touch and touch and I love it verse 28 says this it says because she heard she came she touched because she thought some translations say she thought to herself if I can just touch his clothes I'll be healed so here's what I want you to see she thought to herself which means she had a mental picture of the actions and the results. Huh. That, that's a part of what faith is. That, that regardless of the doctor saying there's nothing we can do for you, I'm sorry, boo. Regardless of the people say, I'm sorry, the trial, the clinical trial hadn't been approved. Regardless of all of that, she says, but wait a minute, I see this image. That if I can just get to him, if I, 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 if I believe that if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made well. She saw herself being healed. She saw stuff changing. And can I ask you a question? What do you see? Because I don't know about you, but I see our communities healed. I see families being brought back together. I see marriages turned around. Somebody's like, well, well I, was, I, was doing, um, I was doing an interview uh, a couple of days ago. I was doing an interview with a magazine from California and, and was just talking about uh, issues and things. And, and they said, well, how is it that you're able, in light of everything, to stay hopeful? And I said, it's because of what I see. I know that when people really come in contact with this God who changed my life and turned my life around, that he'll do the same for them. And so what keeps me hopeful is that I'm not too focused on what I see with my physical eyes, but I'm focused on what I see with my spiritual sight. I see people coming to Jesus. I see our country getting better. I see our communities getting better. And I just got three amens right there. What do you see? What, what, what do you see? Look at your name asking, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? I love it. Verse 29 says, she touched him. Watch this. She, she touched the hem of his garment. And immediately, listen to me, immediately her bleeding, her internal issue was resolved we spend so much time responding and reacting to surface stuff when, when what really needs to happen for true healing and freedom to take place is that Jesus has got to touch the deeper internal issue. I, I don't know who I'm talking to, but, but you are frustrated and exasperated because you are so busy responding to surface stuff. That ain't crazy, and I don't know why they act like this. No, no, they act like that because it's a deeper issue. There's, a, there's something deeper going on. It is not what you see on the surface. It's internal, and what you got to do is get them in the place so that Jesus could touch that deeper internal issue. Oh, I'm running out of time. Let me see if I can hurry up. As soon as she touched him, Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? Now, 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 now you missed it. Here's the thing. Remember, there's a crowd and there's everybody pushing and pressing to get him. This is why the disciples said, what, what, what are you talking about? Who touched you? All these people touching you. But there's a difference. When, when you're okay with just touching out of familiarity versus when you touch because you're hungry. There's a difference 
When, when you touch and say, oh, this is just service as usual. Let me just go to church one time out of the month. That's not the kind of touch that'll stop Jesus in his tracks and say, wait a minute, who touched me? The touch that stops the master is when folks say, I know who you are. My heart is hungering for you. So I'm reaching out to touch you because if I get a touch, everything will change. Woo! This, this is not for the casual touching. This is it's not for the casual touching. This, this, is, this is for the heart of hunger. But then wait a minute. It's going to require not just patience, but it's going to require persistence. Because the entire time that all of this has taken place, J. Iris he's waiting. Can you hurry this up? Jesus. Uh, you know, and they said, oh, bless your heart. You want to tell me your whole story. Cut it. We don't need the whole story, ma'am. You don't have to tell them 12 years of your stuff. The whole time that Jesus is having this encounter with this woman, J. Iris is waiting. And can you imagine what's going through his mind? Can you imagine the fear, the concern? Man, if we don't get there soon enough, my daughter's going to die. The next generation's going to be lost. And then in verse 35, it says, while Jesus was still speaking, Jesus is still having the discussion with the lady. While he's still speaking, some men come from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and say, hey, 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 hey. Man, we ran here as fast as we could. And we're sorry to tell you, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring, here it is, what they said. Isn't that something? That sometimes you don't even have to dignify certain things. <laughs> Jesus is still talking to the woman. Here's what they're telling Jairus. And it says that he ignores that. He just tells the synagogue ruler just one thing. He says, don't be afraid. Just believe. He doesn't even dignify. Jairus is like, did you just hear what they said? Jesus, see, I told you, man, if you wouldn't mess up with this woman, if you would have just focused on my knees, we could have got there sooner. Jesus said, eh, I'm not going to talk about that right now. I just want to tell you, don't be afraid. Just believe. And when Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe, the literal translation of that, um, from the Greek New Testament, the literal translation of don't be afraid, just believe is this. Don't be afraid. Keep on believing. Uh, that, that's what Jesus is saying. J Jesus, it, it, it's translated in English, don't stop believing. But the way that the Greek is framed, he's literally saying, keep on. Keep on believing. Ke keep on believing. This is the challenge for anybody who comes to Jesus. Will you believe the circumstances? Oh, will you keep on believing God? Will, will you believe what is right in front of you that's been threatening to, to stress you out, that's been threatening to challenge you to throw in the towel? Will, will you believe that or will you keep on believing with God all things are possible? Will, will, you, will you give up to despair? Will you give up to hopelessness? Or will you have the faith to keep on believing? The only thing that Jesus says to Jairus is just keep on believing. In other words, the same belief that brought you to me is the same belief you need when we get to your daughter. You miss it. The same belief that got you to Jesus, got your family to Jesus, is the same kind of belief you need to bring other people to Jesus. Did I say it too fast? Just keep on believing. J. Iris, it's not hard. J. Iris, you don't have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. It, it doesn't require you to cross every T and dot every I. You just have to keep on believing. And as a matter of fact, you don't need a whole bunch of faith. You just need a little bit. Matthew 17 and verse 20, Jesus says that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? Mustard seed is tiny. In the words of my grandmother, it's t -nightchy. It's t -nightchy. Mustard seed is real small. Jesus says if you literally have, have faith that size, 
You can speak to that mountain and say, mountain, be now removed, and nothing will be impossible to you. He says, Jairus, don't, don't, don't worry about what they said. In other words, don't focus on what they said. Don't you dare allow discouragement and despair to flood your life. Just keep on believing. And I've come here to talk to some of the Jairuses in this room and at Derby and at Aniston and watching me online. Look at me and listen to what the word of the Lord is for you. Don't you dare allow despair to sweep over your life and to cause you to think that it's over. Don't you dare allow discouragement to make you feel like there is nothing left that can be done. Don't you dare allow hopelessness to flood your soul to the degree that you think that your best days are behind you. The devil is a liar. All you got to do is keep believing. That's the key, J. Iris. Keep believing. You believe five years ago, believe God today. You got to wipe away every tear, wipe away all doubt and say, still, I believe. Because that's the key. Remember I told you earlier that Jairus thought it was a delay, thought it was an interruption. But that woman held the key for his breakthrough because after 12 years of suffering, she kept believing. She kept believing and said, I know that if I can just touch the hem of his garment, regardless of what the doctor said, I'll be made whole. She kept believing. So watch this. The interruption and the delay was on purpose because Jesus, being the Alpha and the Omega, knowing all things, knew that what J. Iris was going to need up ahead was the persistence to keep on believing. So in his love, he orchestrates an opportunity for J. Iris to get a front row seat and to learn from this woman who had the tenacity to keep on believing despite 12 years of suffering. Because in that woman, she's giving Jairus the key that he was going to need for his daughter. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? There's some people that God will connect you to in you serving their needs that will help you with what you need to get from God. I wish that I could uh, get you to maybe high five three or four people around you and tell them just keep believing. Keep believing. If, if, if there's anybody that doesn't mind getting up out of their seat I think you ought to find a couple of people who resonate with this message and tell them keep believing because a part of what's going to happen in the exchange is you may meet somebody or connect with somebody that'll tell you you're doggone right keep believing because I did and God blessed me they may be carrying what you need for where you are do you hear what I'm trying to tell high five somebody say baby keep on believing keep on believing keep on believing keep on can I find folk that will agree with me up in here we are not given to doubt we are not given to discouragement we walk by faith and not by sight high five somebody tell them I don't care what you're going through you better keep on believing and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and go keep keep on keep on believing keep on believing he'll make your latter days greater than your former to keep on Believing what the devil meant for bad, he'll turn it around and make it mean for your good. Keep on believing. Now, J. Iris, part of the reason that you got to find some people to agree with is because in verse 37, it says when they got to J. Iris' house, there were folk that thought it was over. Verse 37 says that when he got to the house, he didn't let anybody go in with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, because when he got to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw this commotion. People crying, wailing loudly. And Jesus went in and said, what is all of this commotion? The child is not dead. She's just asleep. Now watch this. They laughed at him. So then he put them all out. All y'all. You, you, you. All. I don't care where you go, but you got to get up out of here. You got to go. <laughs> I don't know who this is for. Don't try to hold on to people that God is shifting out of your life. <laughs> I don't know who this is for. You crying over them and God said, but you got to start shouting for what I'm getting ready to bring you to. So stop crying over the folk that I had to put out because they couldn't agree with what I'm trying to do in your life. Watch this. But people, watch this, they laughed. 
to have the audacity, Pastor Quentin, the unmitigated gall to laugh at our Savior. And and this this is a really important lesson because I want you to understand that the Bible says this for a reason, that the things of God are often foolishness to them that are in the world. And and I want you to understand this. I believe that we're moving more into a day and time where where Christianity is increasingly going to be ridiculed because there's this growing segment of people who say things like, "I'm, I'm a realist. I'm just keeping it real. I'm just keeping it 100. Uh. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know how to do the 100 symbol, you know, but on Instagram, boom, 100, that's 100. Woo-hoo-hoo. And they look, at, they look at things of faith. Why are you tithing and why are you going to church? I could have slept in and played golf. Why are you worshiping and all that singing to the Lord? They, they look at that stuff and say, that doesn't make any sense. They literally laugh. At our God, oh, you, you look at y'all, y'all don't, y'all don't know what you're doing, and, and you're uneducated, and oh, you don't have to believe all of that. And, and they literally laugh. But I want you to understand that just like they laughed at Jesus and just like they may laugh at us, what, what I love is that God will always get the last laugh. Yeah. And, and, and when, people, when people tell you, I'm just keeping it real, you tell them, well, I'm just keeping it faith. Because the just shall live by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can be a realist and base your life on what you've seen, but I believe that there's something beyond what is seen. Oh, I wish I had time to deal with that. My, my daughter, let me, let me just give this to you. This morning I was getting dressed, and, and you know our kids were up, and my daughter came in the room, and she was reading some kind of encyclopedia and some kind of book, and she said, she said Dan, this book says that the universe is expanding uh, at so and such rate um, every minute, and so it is literally expanding. Expanding. She said, isn't that amazing? And I said, what's even more amazing is that the Bible says that the word of God is literally holding it all together. Oh, you missed it. She was reading the book by a realist. But my book says that there's something greater than what the realists see. Hallelujah. So let me come back. Look at somebody tell them God's going to get the last laugh. Do you remember Genesis 18 when there's a Trinitarian kind of appearance of God? It's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three men come and they talk to Abraham. And, and Abraham is talking to them about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and Sarah is, is in the tent making food. And God says, God says to Abraham, about this time next year, I'm going to come back and your wife's going to be pregnant. And Sarah overhears it, but she's in, she's in the little tent area making food. And she starts laughing. <laughs> whatever <laughs> that's cute that's cute God Woo, you know my season has come Whew. that's that's over God that ain't happening and then God confronts her this is Genesis 18 God says um hey why'd you laugh and then you know she gets nervous because God put her on the spot and she said oh I, I didn't laugh how you gonna lie to God you know <laughs> And I love it. He says, he says, no, yes, you did. He says, yes, you did. He says, well, let me tell you something. About this time next year, I'm going to come back, and you're going to be with child. And here's the thing, because I'm going to get the last laugh. You're going to name the child Isaac, because Isaac's name means God laughs. So every time you call his name, Isaac, come in here, boy. (laughs) You're going to have me in your mind laughing at you. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha, don't tell me what I cannot do. <laughs> don't tell me that my God won't come through when he says he will come. I don't, I don't know who this is for, but what you got to know is God's going to get the last laugh. And when folk laugh at you, say, but wait a minute, when my God is done, baby, God's going to get the last laugh. As I move into the promotion, as my family changes and turns around, God is going to get the last laugh up in here, up in here.
We hope you enjoyed this message. For more resources, visit the Worship Center CC.org and VanMoody.org. You will also find Van Moody on all social media platforms. Again, we thank you for your support.